This presentation is for Chapter A5, Event Tree Analysis. The objectives are to define event tree terminology and, and rules, demonstrate common applications. The outline consists of the structure, terminology associated with event trees, calculations, and construction. Event tree analysis is an inductive modeling technique that uses Boolean logic, in other words, true or false, to evaluate a sequence of events. Some of the frequently used concepts and techniques that will be discussed include conditional probabilities, mutually exclusive events, partitioning, and consistent percentiles. An event tree is a graphical depiction of the sequence of events leading to a particular set of outcomes. Its construction is sequential from left to right, beginning with an initiating event and proceeding with all necessary subsequent events in the order that they occur. Because of entry analysis is an inductive type of analysis, logic moves from cause to effect. Outcomes for dam and levee safety risk analysis are typically breach or non-breach, which have associated life loss and economic consequences. <clears throat> Inventory analysis is the most common approach for estimating dam and levee safety risks. Complex failure modes can be decomposed into a more understandable sequence of events. Inventories assist the understanding, analysis, and communication of dam and levee safety risks and in decision making. Other models are discussed elsewhere in the manual and training. The potential failure mode can be de decomposed into an event tree by extracting the key events from the description. In this example, the key events for overtopping due to seismic crest deformation are shown. The initiator is an earthquake with a peak horizontal acceleration between 0.6 G and 0.8 G. <clears throat> the failure mechanism involves foundation liquefaction slope instability that lowers the embankment crest, and overtopping with breach. The extracted key events can be assembled into an event tree. The Boolean logic is illustrated in the event pair shown, where each pair either occurs or does not occur. The inductive logic is illustrated by the sequence of cause and effect events proceeding from left to right until breach occurs. A simple flood event tree with two potential failure modes will be used to explain basic terminology for event tree analysis. The initiating event on the left side of the event tree is a flood. The flood hazard has been partitioned or discretized by stage into three load ranges <clears throat> in the second column. The probability of the flood being within those load ranges is also shown. Given a flood stage exceeding elevation 1520, two potential failure modes can occur as shown in the third column, monolith sliding and spillway erosion. The conditional probability of failure given the flood is shown for these events. Given failure or breach occurs, the resulting consequences, in this case, life loss, are shown in the last column. A node is a branching point at which a new random variable is introduced in the event tree. A pathway is a unique set of events through the event tree that leads to failure or breach. In this example, there are four pathways that lead to breach. Monolith sliding, spillway erosion for this load range, and monolith sliding and spillway erosion for this load range. The basic event tree rules are summarized on this slide. Branches must be mutually exclusive, meaning only one outcome can occur. Therefore, the probabilities originating from a single node can be summed, and the sum must be equal to one. Because the sum must be equal to one, the branches are collectively exhausted. For the previous example, breach can occur by monolith sliding or spillway erosion. 
or breach does not occur. This encompasses all possible events as shown in the Venn diagram. <clears throat> the sum of the probabilities represented by the three shaded areas equals one. This is also illustrated by the excerpt from the overall event tree for the node with a stage between elevation 1520 and 1550. The sum of the probabilities across all branches equals one. The probabilities for each branch must be conditional on all preceding branches. In other words, the probability of an event depends on all events along pathways to the left in the event tree. The total probability of a particular chain of events or pathway through the event tree can be obtained by multiplying the sequence of conditional probabilities. <clears throat> a simple event tree example illustrates how these rules are applied. Probabilities across branches are summed, and the sum must equal one. Probabilities along pathways are multiplied for each end branch. Probabilities and risks are typically annualized by the flood or seismic hazard <clears throat> and have measurement units of per year. Other measurement units can be applied in other applications. An example would be per demand for gate operations. These values could then be annualized based on the average number of operations in a year. Event trees are typically created for each potential failure mode to develop a system response curve, which is the conditional probability of failure as a function of the loading. An event tree analysis can also be performed for individual potential failure modes to combine the hazard or loading with the performance or the system response curve to assess the significance of each potential failure mode individually, assuming the potential failure modes are mutually exclusive. In other words, cannot occur together. <clears throat> In reality, potential fa failure modes are often not mutually exclusive. So the intersection of the two potential failure modes must be accounted for. This is discussed in Chapter A8, com Combining and Portraying Risks. In the simple event tree example, there are four pathways that lead to breach. Probabilities along each pathway are multiplied for each end branch that results in breach. The annual probability of failure for a potential failure mode is the sum of the end branch probabilities. For monolith sliding, the annual probability of failure is the sum of 0 0.00018 and 0 0.00004. The annual probability of failure for spillway erosion is obtained in a similar manner, and the total annual probability of failure is the sum of all failure in branches, as shown at the bottom of the slide. Average annual life loss is an expected value calculation. The consequences for each failure end branch are weighted by their probability. Mathematically, the sum of these products is the expected value of consequences. It is typically annualized via the hazard curve, making it the average expected annual life loss. To get the consequences associated with dam or levee failure, use the incremental consequences associated with a failure. The incremental consequences are calculated as the difference between the total consequences that occur with a failure and the consequences that would have occurred for the same event if the structure had not have failed. There may be agency specific policy and methodology considerations for whether or not to consider incremental consequences. USACE uses incremental consequences. Annual probability of failure and risk are obtained using numerical integration procedures. Because event tree branches are discrete and input functions are continuous, it's necessary to partition or discretize the loading, analogous to Simpson's rule for integration. <clears throat> In this example, the area under the curve is evaluated by dividing the total area into little trapezoids. With these numerical integration methods, the precision is a function of the number of partitions. More is better. The partitions can be generated manually or automatically. 
and they can be equally or irregularly spaced. Computer software greatly facilitates load partitioning and precision. It is critical to understand the shape of the hazard, system response, and consequence relationships and adequately capture any inflection points with the partition size. <clears throat> In this example, the flood loading is partitioned on annual exceedance probability, or AEP, but it could have also been partitioned on stage. Decisions on whether to truncate or extrapolate need to be made to define the exceedance and non-exceedance intervals at either end of the loading curve. Since these are exceedance probabilities, the probability of the stage being within a given partition is obtained by subtracting the exceedance probabilities. An average is typically used for each partition stage. This can be an arithmetic or geometric average, depending on the form of the function. Arithmetic is most accurate for linear, and geometric is most accurate for logarithmic. Values other than the average can be used as representative values for each stage partition, but this is uncommon. The first partition is the non-exceedance interval, <clears throat> and is the probability that the stage is less than the initial value of elevation 1500. Often, this is a small probability that is included with the next interval. The second partition is a stage between elevations 1500 and 1514, with an average stage of elevation 1507. The third partition is a stage between elevations 1514 and 1560, with an average stage of elevation 1537. The fourth partition is a stage between elevations 1560 and 1600, with an average stage of elevation 1580. In this example, the stage is truncated at elevation 1600, but the annual exceedance probability is not. Although the display plot terminates at 1 in 10,000 annual exceedance probability, the exceedance interval applies to all less frequent events. Therefore, the probability of the exceedance interval is obtained by subtracting 0, 0, 0, 0.0001 and 0. As a check, the area under the curve or the sum of the probabilities equals 1 since the partitions are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So the sum of these equals 1. If exceedance probabilities are used, the area under each partition overlaps. <clears throat> the first partition would be 1. The second partition would be 0.5 overlapping the previous partition. The third partition would be 0.1 again overlapping the previous partitions. The fourth partition would be 0.001 again overlapping the previous partitions. And the last partition would be 0.0001 again overlapping the previous partitions. Therefore, the partitions are no longer mutually exclusive, and the probabilities are being double counted, and the sum will be greater than one. Typically, the partition stage is used to interpolate the system response curve and the consequences from their respective functions. If the calculations are done manually, care must be taken to ensure the partitions adequately capture inflection points in the system response curve. Best practices for interpolation are covered in Chapter A8, Combining and Portraying Risk. Based on the system response curve shown, for an average stage of elevation 1500, the probability is 3 times 10 to the minus 5. Average stage of elevation 1507, the probability is 8 times 10 to the minus 5. For an average stage of 1537, the probability is 0.003. For an average stage of elevation 1580, the probability is 0.09. And for the exceeding stage of elevation 1600, the probability is 0.25. P 
Peak stage is typically used as the independent variable to combine the hazard, system response, and consequence functions. Peak stage is defined as a function of annual exceedance probability. <clears throat> the system response probability and consequences are often defined as a function of peak stage, but other variables may be more appropriate. For example, an overtopping erosion potential failure mode may be a function of the overtopping depth, or a stilling basin erosion potential failure mode may be a function of peak outflow. Similarly, consequences may be a function of peak outflow. The event tree calculations can be set up to perform and apply these variable transformations. Instead of discrete probabilities, Distributions can be assigned to the branch probabilities and consequences, which are randomly sampled in a Monte Carlo analysis. The results are combined to obtain the uncertainty distribution for annual probability of failure and average annual life loss. In this example, a triangular distribution is, is assigned to the first two branches and a uniform distribution is assigned to the last branch. When performing the event tree analysis using Palisades at risk software, for example, and using the default settings, the probabilities for the event tree branches will display the expected value or mean of the input distributions, not the mode or most likely value. Because event tree math is additive and multiplicative, the mean annual probability of failure and mean average annual life loss can be estimated by using the means of the input distributions. The output distribution for annual probability of failure and average annual life loss will typically trend toward a normal or log normal distribution because of the central limit theorem. In probability theory, the central limit theorem states that given certain conditions, the arithmetic mean of a sufficiently large number of iterates of independent random variables, each with a well-defined expected value and well-defined variance, will be approximately normally distributed, regardless of the underlying distribution. Independent sampling of each load partition can generate physically impossible samples. <clears throat> For example, the generated system response curve is not physically possible and is mathematically invalid. A higher flood loading partition, partition three, cannot have a system response probability that is less than a lower flood loading, partition two. The system response curve must be monotonically increasing. This is a common mistake that is made when using at-risk and other similar software. Here is the correct approach. All of the sampled system response curves will be internally consistent and monotonically increasing. This can be done in commercial software by setting up correlated sampling. Another alternative not presented would be to fit an analytical distribution to the system response curve. The parameters of the distribution could be sampled to generate sample system response curves. The system response probabilities could then be interpolated from the sampled curve. The pro to this approach is more accurate than consistent percentile method. The con is accuracy depends on how well the curve fits in analytical distribution. This concludes this presentation. <clears throat>